So today, uh, our, our keynote speaker I want to introduce is Rick Spencer. And he's going to be talking a bit about why the project matters, why all this stuff matters with open source, why, really why, why you're here, right? And so Rick, Rick is the uh, general manager for Business Critical Linux for SUSE. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, I'm uh, very uh, pleased to be here. I really appreciate the invitation to come and meet everyone in the community. As you said, my name is Rick, and I am the general manager of Business Critical Linux at SUSE. I've been there since January 2nd, but we'll spend some time discussing how, how it all happened. How it all happened? How did they end up here? But if you're wondering what that means, that means basically um, the boss of the division in SUSE that makes Linux. And um, I love it. I super have been enjoying being here. So I'm going to have some slides. So first, just when I talk about this slide, we're talking like, why does this matter? Why does this project matter? Like, what's going on here? And um, I put up this elaborate graphic, not AI generated, by the way, um, just to show, like, really, I'm going to talk about it from a pretty personal perspective, perspective of working at SUSE, someone who is very new to the SUSE community, but someone who's not new to the open source community and working in open source, and um, who has a perspective about SUSE from the outside for a long time. Does that sound good? Okay. So first, what's going on here? Before I started, I asked my uh, boss, Thomas, what, uh, what should I be running on my laptop? And he said I should run Leap, which um, I still do. Same laptop. That's a screenshot from this laptop. This is uh, from back um, in December, from before I officially started. And this, like when I set up a new machine for a desktop, this sort of represents to me that I have control of the system. Uh, I don't do a lot on social media, like I don't, don't use Twitter or Facebook or anything like that, but I have an omg.lol account where I blog, and that gives me uh, access to Mastodon and, and such. Um, See there where it says Rick Spencer 3? That's like my handle everywhere that I have a presence. So if you want to look me up on GitHub or Mastodon or I don't know, wherever, like uh, going back to about 2008, you'll uh, find me under that tag. Um, but yeah, I was uh, like actually a little taken aback by how good Leap was. Like, when I installed it, I was expecting a difficult time to install, and I was expecting a difficult time to get set up for productivity, and, like, none of those things happened. Um, I wrote a little, I wrote some blog posts about it over, over time, uh, if you want to go back and see those. So, I've been a super happy user of um, OpenSUSE since even before I started. Um, okay, so how did I end up here? Like, here we are, 2024. I'm in the open SUSE community. I'm working at SUSE. Um, and uh, just in terms of my perspective, I thought it would be helpful just to, like, give, like, you know, maybe a older guy than some of you folks uh, a perspective on just how how weird the world can be that you end up in situations like this. So I started out in 1990 as a young philosophy graduate. So I studied philosophy in college, and uh, I was in the U.S., so of course we studied continental philosophy in the U.S., right? I don't know if you know, but like in the U.S. you study continental philosophy, which is European, and in Europe you study philosophy from America for some reason. So, um, but I also had a degree in psychology, and I went to a college that focused on preparing people for a life of service. 
right? So some people go to colleges where it's like they want to make lawyers and politicians and stuff like that. Uh, if you wanted to be really cool at my college, you would go be a teacher or a social worker or something like that. And that like really represented that you uh, are ready for, you know, a life of real service to the community. So I actually went into community mental health. And so I started out as a, you know, young man working with people with very severe mental illnesses who, you know, we were trying to keep them in the community, keep them from being homeless, keep them out of the hospital, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and it was, it was really rewarding intrinsically, but not so much extrinsically. It didn't really, it's not the field that you go into uh, to support a family, for instance. And so our first baby came, I got married, and then we had a baby, and I thought, you know, maybe I should start thinking about computers again. And so I went to George Mason University, and I got a degree in human factors engineering which is a field of cognitive psychology where you learn about how to design software for to f the human mind. And since I had a background as a programmer, I focused on what was called the psychology of programming. And if you want to geek out about that, I'd like, love to talk about it. It's super interesting. Um, but that made me end up getting recruited by Microsoft. So in 1998, I uh, picked my family up and moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, to Seattle, in fact, um, which began a 15-year stint living in Seattle. And I worked at Microsoft for quite a long time. And I started there in Visual Studio and designing the debugger and the editor. And I spent a lot of focus on the .NET language, um, C Sharp. That was really interesting because they were like, we need some kind of open source strategy, even though we're pretty hostile to open source. So they had this thing called Mono, um, and there was like the, there was a C Sharp had like an open specification, and there was like an open source implementation of that as part of Mono and, and all this stuff. And while I was there, my philosophy degree was a raging advantage because I could write. And so I would go to meetings and come out and summarize the meetings and, and bludgeon people with my uh, writing. And that led to me going up through the program management ranks. And that was basically being sort of the um, spiritual leader of teams, of, of development teams. And by the time I left, I was working in Windows, and I was uh, running the team that made the SDK for tablets. But uh, something happened on the way, which was that I got very interested in open source and started contributing to open source. And this was, uh, it's hilarious, because now, of course, Microsoft is you know, very open to other perspectives. But at the time, they were not. And so I ended up having to uh, leave Microsoft to pursue a career in open source. Uh, it got so bad that uh, my boss came to my office and like the poor guy could tell someone made him come talk to me because they realized the reason that my emails were in text was because I was using Outlook web access at home instead of Outlook. And that was because I was running Linux on my laptops at home. And they were like, oh, we think you're running Linux at home. And it's not a rule that you can't do that, but they, uh, you know, they were a little offended by that. And so I, I could see the writing was on the wall. I quit Microsoft with actually out of plan. I was just like, I'm burned out. I'm going to go work in open source. And it was like, you're crazy. Like, you have this great job at Microsoft. What the hell, What are you doing? And, but in fact, um, I, I spent a few months writing some code, and then I got... Uh, recruited by a local family business, which is a big real estate agency. And they, they had a new website that they were having trouble getting out. And so I spent a year helping them with that. And then in the meantime, I saw a posting for Ubuntu. And I'd started contributing to the Ubuntu community in different ways, mostly writing about how to program, how to be a programmer targeting, targeting it. And by that, I mean a Python programmer to be very specific. Um, so I applied for a job as the Ubuntu engineering manager for the desktop. And you have to understand, at the time, it was like a very exciting project. And uh, you know, it was controversial because like, you know, people in Debian were upset and, and this kind of thing. But it was like people were super excited about the opportunity to spread 
software freedom. You know, uh, we, we, we saw people who were using Windows as sort of almost being enslaved in a way, right? Because they, um, you know, they didn't, like, the, the level of lock-in that they were experiencing and, and such, um, and that they, did, they didn't see another way. And so we were just really excited about this opportunity to create software freedom for people who didn't have, like, the technical skills themselves to, like, opt into software freedom themselves. Um, uh, those were, like, really great, days, especially at the beginning when I thought we were going to succeed. And I thought, you know, like, oh, and we're going to have a phone OS, and um, uh, we, you know, we just had a lot of fun times. Unfortunately, I got promoted a few times, and I ended up, like, running the project and all this stuff. So it was, like... Uh, you know, it became a lot of responsibility, and then I ended up leaving in 2017, and I joined a company called Bitnami, and our mission was to package all of the open source cloud software in the world and make it available, and we packaged everything, and uh, our customers were the cloud providers. Our users were like all of you, and uh, we ended up getting acquired, Turned out not to be a really good match for me in the acquiring organization when I, I told them, like, uh, I will only work at home, I will only manage remote teams, I will only work on open source. And uh, they were like, okay, would you consider a severance package? And so I, I took that and I went and I joined some friends at um, Influx. DB, and there we made an open source time series database and this guy named Paul Paul Dix, he's a super cool guy, like, um, he's the founder of the company, and so I worked there for about four years, and um, really, really loved it. I was, like, on the very senior executive team there, which was, you know, uh, just like at Ubuntu, very interesting, like, actually, all the three of those places, it's, like, really interesting when you're, like, looking every day at, like, what's our runway? You know, if we spend this money... Will, like, how long will we be able to survive? And, you know, if we spend this money, will we make enough money to extend or the runway and all that kind of businessy management stuff? I, of course, am way more passionate about the technology and the users and the community. But uh, I really liked working at Influx Data. And then last September, you know, one of the things I love about working remotely is that um, every now and then we're like, let's just go try a different place. So last September, my wife and I went and we tried Crete, and we were living in this city on Crete called, depending on how you pronounce it, we called it Hana, but some people call it Shania. The people there, I can't pronounce it the way they pronounce it. But uh, So we were sitting there, um, I was working, and I got a call from Susa, this guy named John, and he's like, Hey, I'm an executive recruiter at SUSE. We're looking for somebody to run uh, the um, SUSE Linux division. And I was like, wow, I never thought I'd get the opportunity again to work on a distro, like a community open source distro. Like, this is what I live for, right? And I just thought it was just over for me. I'd never have that opportunity again. Of course, I didn't tell the recruiter, but I immediately went into like, what can I, you know, what can I do to get this job mode? And, you know, I talked to some people like Jeff here and other people uh, as part of the recruiting process and um, super delighted that I got the job, uh, very honored. And um, I started on January 2nd officially, so I am a super newbie. So please keep that in mind as we see the content that I'm presenting today, because really, um, I feel like I'm just being introduced to the community now. Uh, okay, so just backing up a bit. Has anyone here ever ha had a call with me? Okay, quite a few people. So you recognize this is the background. This is my real background. This is not AI generated. This is my, my man cave here. Um, let me just explain a few things, because I think it helps people kind of get where I'm coming from. So this box here, these are all like the tools that I use for different electronics projects. And I used to do this a lot more than I do now. I've just uh, 
built everything I wanted to. I have a longer version of this talk where it shows like a million little projects that I made, but I don't know about you. Does anybody else have a box like this? I have like three of them, yeah. <laughs> it's full of Raspberry Pis and Arduinos. This cardboard box, at the beginning of the pandemic, I made this thing where you could hold your hand over it and it would take your temperature and then print out the temperature. And I was thinking like, put it in front of stores so people could show that they didn't have a fever when they went in. But then I couldn't source the, uh, the uh, temperature sensors. Like they just, China ran out of those in one day. Uh, so I have like three of those boxes. Um, a while ago, I was into 3D printing. Um, I still do it, and like when I got the job, I printed, uh, I found online these uh, Sousa keychains. So somebody in the community put these up. Was that, any, was that somebody here? Oh, no, I'm disappointed. But the one thing I love about 3D printing is that people take all their models and they open source them and they, they just release them and with uh, licenses that you can, you can take them and remix them and share your remixes back and everything. Um, I use these for luggage tags now so I can tell my luggage when it comes out. Uh, this is a robot that I built. So what happened here was um, I went to this very small IoT conference and it was, uh, there was a guy there named Nathan from a company called SparkFun. And he uh, gifted me something called the SparkFun Inventors Kit. I hadn't really been that interested in electronics and, and things like that before, but the SparkFun Inventors Kit came with an Arduino. So like what's amazing about this is like Arduino is open hardware. So they like, of course they sell their own Arduinos and specify them, but they release in a way that a company like SparkFun can take and improve upon those designs and share them in, di in different ways. So they, they created an Arduino that was for people like me who were learning, and they put it into a kit that had a breadboard and jumper cables and all these sensors and all this stuff, and then instructions for how to learn everything. And uh, it just like sucked me up into this community of people who are doing like really fun things with our Arduinos. And, um, Oh, you know, of course, they, they all shared their source code and, and everything. I, I shared mine back. Uh, but then I decided, for some reason, I had to write, make a robot. I don't know why. I just had to make a robot. So I bought a chassis from Amazon. And you can see there's the uh, Raspberry Pi that powers it. And my wife, Ilsebe, and my daughter, Sophie, were away traveling. And while they were away, I had finally gotten control of the uh, LCD screen there, and um, so I sent them a little message. The reason you needed the LCD screen was because the way you controlled the robot was if he wasn't connected to the network, he would tell you the IP address or the access point, and like you would connect to it with your phone and then put in the, the access point information, and then you would reach him over the local network, and um, there's a little UI to drive him around. That, by the way, all my source code's called Rickbot. All, my, all the source code for him is up on uh, GitHub. But I looked at it like a year ago and it was embarrassingly bad. Uh, so this is the thing I got from SparkFun and this is me prototyping something called Plant Buddy. So when I got to Influx Data, I made this uh, device called Plant Buddy, which measures the soil temperature, soil um, moisture level, the humidity, the air temperature and the light level and puts all that data into influx data, all those metrics, which is what influx data is for in a time series database. I was like really proud of that because that got kind of sucked up into the community as like the reference application. Because I wrote like code for doing alerting and, and, and graphing and all this stuff. And that sort of became the reference application for the community. Um, of course, uh, my friend Jay uh, just completely improved all the code, so you wouldn't 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 recognize it uh, as mine now because it's it's much better. But um, okay, so a lot of times people ask me about these posters. So these are from a band called the Grateful Dead. Has anybody in here heard of this ancient band? Couple couple people. So I, I started uh, going to Grateful Dead concerts in 1984. 
and I still go. Um, and I get posters from their shows, and uh, I hang them up uh, behind me in different configurations. But one thing that's really interesting is, first of all, um, people who are fans of the music are really feel like they're in a community, right? And like, like you run into people who are fans, it's just like uh, open source developers, right? If, like you meet someone and they're a Grateful Dead fan or an open source developer, like you immediately have an affinity with them and uh, you know, you end up um, like halfway to being friends. They were sort of, for me, the first, my first exposure to open source because what they did was they let people tape their shows and share the tapes as long as they were like a non-commercial usage, right, as long as you weren't competing with their albums. And so, like, their way of being heard was not on the radio, which made sense because their songs could be, like, 40 minutes long, but through people, like, sharing and uh, trading tapes. So you can still go up to uh, archive.org, and there's, like, thousands of hours of their music up there, and it's all completely, completely free in uh, both meanings of the word. And I do, I do play music. I don't play the guitar so much anymore. I honestly don't play the mandolin that much anymore, but when I play, I play the mandolin. Does anyone else in here play anything? A few folks, all right. So um, here's another like, sort of aspect of like, like, uh, like community and open source and sharing. Like most of the music that I play, I, I, I like to say I play all the hits of the 90s, but the 1890s. So like all this music is in the public domain already. And the way that you learn it is like other people show you and uh, sharing it and you, you get together and you jam. And uh, uh, the music I like are, is like specifically fiddle tunes, which um, to not geek out too much, it's like there's like, it's, there's the, these eighth notes, but with a really, really strong swing to it. And the idea is like, you take like a pass through the tune and improvise over it while your friends back you up and then someone else takes a turn. And uh, it's really fun to play. Uh, probably more fun to play than it is to listen to. But all this music is all shared. It's all free. It's very in the moment. And... Um, there's like just a big community of people around still playing this kind of music together. And then this is um, the last thing on my desktop. That's my $65 laptop. You can go read all about it on my blog. I got it at Micro Center, which is this like super discount place in, um, in the US. It's running Tumbleweed right now. Um, I was really excited because when I installed Tumbleweed, the uh, network kept, the Wi-Fi module kept just like disconnecting or, or it wasn't even disconnecting. It would just stop getting data, stop reporting data. And I was like, yes, my first bug report. I'm going to like write a bug report and I'm going to learn how to be like a contributor to OpenSUSE because, you know, I'll work with the kernel developers to get them the information that they need to... To, uh, to debug it, and I, I got my Bugzilla account, and I've, it's never reproduced since then. <laughs> yes, I guess somebody fixed it on the way. All right, so what's this? This, this is my, part of my childhood, so I uh, started as a um, programmer on a TSR-80. My school got a bunch of these, and there was just like a community of us who would hang around after school. And uh, the only thing you could do with them was program, really. Like, that's what the computers were for. They were for programming. Like, there was like, you know, I guess there was software that was distributed in some ways, but what's over here was called a listing, and this is how we shared software. Like in the back of magazines, or there'd be whole books of them. There'd just be basic programs written out. And I know some people who were way smarter than me were doing like assembly and stuff, but we all just uh, learned basic programming. And so it was weird. I never, like, I learned how to program at like, you know, I was like 12 years old. And I, I never, like, valued it as a skill just because I just picked it up when I was a kid. And so, uh, but, and we all shared our code. 
I remember I had this, this, uh, this great guy named Jack Harrington who was like way smarter than me and would, uh, we, he'd be in the computer room after school and he would always help me with whatever question I have. And I have very explicit memory of him explaining that like I needed to define a variable to track state in a game that I was writing. And I just like, I'm very, uh, I talked to him recently and he doesn't remember this at all, but I have very explicit memory of me, him teaching me this. What's interesting is he's like big in the React community, I think, but he's still like, he, he's a professional programmer, but he also has a YouTube channel where he teaches still. Like to this day, he's still like uh, this, this source of uh, wisdom and, and knowledge. So that's kind of how I got into open source, really, and just like always just thought of source code as being open from the beginning. So fast forwarding a little bit, I just, here's an example of some project that I worked on uh, when I, actually before I joined Canonical, this sort of got me in my foot in the door when I was talking to Canonical about the Ubuntu job. Um, I wrote a Ruby on Rails application and then I started, uh, I took up swimming. And so I would be swimming, swimming, and I'm a very slow swimmer, which gave me a lot of time to think. And over the course of like two weeks of swimming, I designed in my mind like a development environment for the Ubuntu desktop. And uh, I, f I forget what I called it at first, but it was very Rails-like, right? So there were commands that would create a template I was like, you just use Glade, just use Python, just use uh, gedit. And so it was like, you know, at the time, if you wanted to learn how to write a desktop application, they were like, sure, here's literally 50 options to choose from, right? And it's like, you know, do you want Qt and C, Qt with Python? Do you want like a GDK? Do you want like how, like, or maybe you want Tinker, like there's like so many options. I say, like, you know, I really think the community would benefit from somebody just defining one way from beginning to end. And so I wrote a book, and which I'm, I, I'm, I sadly lost, but uh, I had like six chapters of like how to write an application. Um, and then my friend Digi Roach, like after I joined Canonical and uh, started showing people there, he was just like appalled by the code, so he re re rewrote it all, which is frankly how all the best projects I've ever had have gone, is like, you know, I put out code out there that was useful, and then some good programmer objects to its quality and then re rewrites it for me in, in one night. Diddy and I were friends, we're still friends, uh, we, we were friends for years, we used to change house, exchange houses and stuff like that. Um, He's got little kids now, so I don't, don't talk to him as much. Uh, so I've written a lot of these kind of application frameworks to sort of help people get, like, get going with uh, different aspects of open source. Um, another thing that I do a lot is uh, I call it writing to learn. And so you'll see a lot of, like, these I consider, like, the best contributions I personally am able to make, just, like, given my skills. So just quickly here, like, back in 2011, after I wrote so many applications that I knew how to write undo and redo stacks in two ways. So it was, like, just once and for all, explained for everybody who's a Python programmer how to do undo and redo. And then over here, remember that, that robot that I showed? Part of it was like you had to control the amount of power that goes to the wheels. And um, from the battery into the motors. And you know, you wanted, there's like two, 255 levels of uh, energy that you could let flow. So you used an L293 d chip and it took me quite a long time to figure out how to use it. So I wrote this and put it up on GitHub so other people could, uh, get a fast track to learning. It's funny because I actually, every time I need to use one, I end up referring to this myself. Uh, so that's a writing to learn. I think that's like, um, like a really nice contribution that people can make. Um, okay, so now let's, uh, let's, uh, so now you kind of see like, you know, just the way like I, I view the world. Now let's talk, like I'd like to just talk a little bit about the way I uh, view SUSE um, and OpenSUSE 
and all these projects around it. I like to caveat this with like, I understand that I'm very new to the community and these are not super well-formed thoughts. So, uh, you know, I, I invite people to help me learn and, um, but let's go. So first of all, 30 years, 20 years. This is not like a flash in the pan project. Do these numbers mean anything to anybody? 30 years ago was the first project called, with the name SUSE in it, and 20 years ago was the first project with the name OpenSUSE in it, right? Like these things are here to stay. These are not like flimsy, uh, you know, flashy memes, right? This is like, this is a real project. Like think of how many people have benefited from these projects over the years. User as contributor to user. Like this is like, this is a significant meaty project. This is a foundation of the open source community, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, so what's going on here? This is uh, strip mining and I don't want to call out any specific projects or companies or anything, but I think we can all see that there's certain areas where people have moved into a more of a short-term mode of thinking, right? Typically what I've seen is like a company will get acquired by a bigger company and that acquirer will look at the user base and say, hey, you know what, like those users are kind of locked in. We could probably like raise prices a lot and they, they'd have nowhere to go. And if they do go somewhere, they, it would take them a couple years. In the meantime, we could probably recoup everything that we used to, to buy that company with, right? So I call this strip mining. Whether you're strip mining the community, strip mining the user base, um, uh, I want to... I'm really proud to work at SUSE because I just do not see us doing this. Like the, the community and the company's value system is really antithetical to this kind of concept, right? So if, um, let me talk a little bit of what I mean by that, really specifically from the community point of view. So um, let's say you want a base image. Do we lock you into the right base image that puts you into our marketing funnel so that that base image then turns into like, okay, we reach out to you and then like, you know, do we withdraw base images from the community so that, you know, we send people down the path that we want them? No, that is just like not in the SUSE mindset, right? So the SUSE, the open SUSE community lets you say, uh, Hey, you can choose between a rolling or a stable release depending on your needs. And you can choose between a traditional and an immutable OS depending on your needs. And in fact, there's other projects that have built on this. Like I know I put micro OS here, but I know that Aeon I, I think is built on, on micro OS. For example, there's probably other things that are built on it as well. Uh, so I know this is an oversimplification, but I think this is really cool that um, we celebrate fulfilling our needs as contributors, but also, you know, the, the needs of users who are picking this stuff up. And it goes a little deeper. This was not made by AI either. This is a drawing, again, an oversimplification that I did for one of my blog posts. Um, and this is just meant to help people understand the relationship of open build server, internal build server. But the main thing I want to show is the packagers here. And this is like one of the things that I love about OpenSUSE is that the project has like so many options for me, right? So I can choose the base image that I want. And then because we're like different community members are pulling from different upstreams, then I can assemble the stack on top of that, which makes sense to me personally. And even if it's not like in Zipper, I can find an OBS, maybe somebody's made a version that works for me, or, and there's other repositories and et cetera. So this, um, this notion of choice is very powerful for me. 
but then also because you can see everything in open build service, like all the source code's there as well, right? So like, it's not just choice. Like, you know, you get choice at a restaurant, but you get freedom also, right? Because like all you can go back to the, the source code and do what you need for, for that. Even though somebody like me might not have the skills to take advantage of that, um, at least I benefit indirectly from it. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about then is like opportunity, right? Like as a user, the fact, like okay, Tumbleweed may not be the f most cutting edge rolling release, right? There may be some that are twitchier and like, you know, packages are available within hours of the main upstream. But like Tumbleweed is, remarkably stable, right? And so even tumbleweed is something that you can really build something important out of. And so these open SUSE projects that we put out there create really important opportunities for people, whether it's to fulfill a personal need, whether it's a professional need, or even just like a basic life need, right? Like I would trust this project to like, like power a you know computer controlled water pump for my village, right? So, um, and our focus on quality, I think, and just like thinking about the people consuming the software and making sure they're having that good experience, I think is a big part of that. All right, so I'll finish up in time. I might have time for a few questions. So, again, this part is a little vague but it's just like to communicate like why, why I'm here and, and why I'm in it for the long haul. And the first is the community, right? If you look, look back, what is community? Some people define it as your community is like the, those people that you see recurring in different settings, right? And, um, whether it's people that you're working with in uh, Bugzilla, or you're on planning calls with them, or they're doing code reviews for you, et cetera. Um, and also just hanging out and coming and getting together in spaces like this. And like, like I live for this, like being like part of these communities around these like interests. Uh, but, you know, like the music is fun. Those are fun communities. But this software that we're making is very meaningful. So there's like a meaningful community built around a meaningful project. And then the second is, is freedom. Um, freedom means different things to other people. But, you know, um, when I look at the way SUSE the company behaves and the, the communities around it, I think this is like just a non-negotiable aspect of most, you know, the things that we do. Um, I feel that if somebody had any need that they wish to fulfill with the software that this community produces, like they'd be able to. There's like no, no um, prior constraints on that. And then the last bit there is, is opportunity. And this is, um, I'm not sure how many people think about this, but I think about this a lot. Like, like a good open source project like this creates real opportunity for other people, like real economic opportunity, right? Like you're starting a business, you know, you could be anywhere in the world, maybe somewhere that's like not well funded. Maybe you don't have a cutting edge Risk Five server, and like that's not your issue. Your issue is that you're starting with like leftover hardware. Well, guess what? We're there. We're there to support you. We have the software. You can get an image, and also if you ask questions, if you need help, like we're right there to help you. And this is really, I think, an important uh, aspect of communities like uh, OpenSUSE. I also think um, it provides opportunities to contribute and collaborate, which is uh, just a, necess a necessary part of the human condition. And so just having the community there and creating those opportunities for people to hop in and contribute artwork or contribute bug reports, contribute 
documentation, like all these kinds of, like these opportunities, like I think are super meaningful. So my last slide, this one is AI generated, by the way. It just, this is just to remind me to express my gratitude. Like I was like really happy when they invited me to come and, and talk at the OpenSUSE conference since I'm like really new to the community. Um, I don't feel like I've made any like really substantial con contribution yet. Although, you know, I hope next year that I'm here talking about maybe some of the impact that as a community member, as any community member, like I've been able to, to have on the project. Um, Okay, I think we have five minutes for questions. Okay. If there are any questions. Yeah. I can't tell if he has a question or is going to the bathroom. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Not a question, but you were talking about a keychain for the 3D printing. We have a little... Lego. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. Okay, yeah. We have a little Lego Kebelian for 3D printing, which is on GitHub now, so if you are interested in, you know, OpenSUSE branded stuff, it's not exactly OpenSUSE, but it's close enough. Okay. So that could be your next project. We could use some <laughs> improved STLs. It's very difficult to print. Okay. Oh. You have it on Slack already. <laughs> Did you have a question, sir? Here, do you just want to come use this mic? Okay. He wants to be far away from me when he asks. I'll, uh... <laughs> you were pretty careful about asking about, or stating that you come from a philosophy background. And I wondered how you felt like that had helped you beyond just writing. Um, so he's asking how did my philosophy background help me beyond just writing. So first of all, when anyone makes fun of anyone for getting a philosophy degree, when they're like, uh -huh, what are you going to go do work in the philosophy factory or whatever, I say, you don't understand. Like, if you have a philosophy degree, you can do whatever you want because what you have done is you have learned how to learn. Whatever you learn today is not going to be particularly relevant five years from now. So if you have mastered the art of hierarchical thinking and being able to break down concepts and learn, then uh, I encourage all people to go into philosophy and actually liberal arts in general uh, for that reason. Um, obviously, I'm partial to philosophy, but I have the same views of like history and, and other things. So did that answer your question? It also taught me a lot about ethics, but we can talk about that over beer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, another question? The uh, TRS-80 Model 1 that you showed, is that an actual functioning machine? Oh, I don't know. I got that from the internet, but I assume so. I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos of people reconditioning old machines like that. So I know there's, there's, there's quite a few out there. But I still remember, like, the commands to get it going. And I, I, still, I still remember that. I, I, my next computer was a Commodore 64. But I didn't really program that one too much. I was just more like pirating and playing, playing games and such. But um, I programmed it a little. What, why did you react that way? Did you program a Commodore 64? Or? Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We were all kids one, at one time. At one time. Okay. Uh, just once again, I really thank everyone for the welcome here. I want you to know I'm Rick Spencer 3, like everywhere. Reach out, um, meet me if, you know, we're hanging around if you have any other questions. And um, I hope you enjoy the uh, rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>